Uh, my office hours will be Tuesdays and Thursdays, 3 to 3.45 p.m. in DL-464. That's my office. Um, there is uh, the course text. So this is a book by Bertsekas. It's called Neurodynamic Programming. So Bertsekas and Seth Siklis. Um, Neurodynamic Programming, this is not the book that we are going to be following for the entire class, but uh, many of the lectures will be based on topics from this book. And on MDP, there is this book by Putterman, uh, Markov Decision Processes. So that's also a very good book. So if you are planning to work in this area of MDP and reinforcement learning, these are the two books I would highly recommend you buy. Uh, but it's not really required for this class. Evaluation policy, there will be four homeworks and one research project. You can do research project in groups. I would uh, uh, recommend that you start forming the groups now. And uh, within a month, I guess, I'll ask you guys to inform me what is the project you are working on and what individual members of the group are going to contribute to. Uh, the project report will be submitted online on the Carmen website. There, there is no exam in this particular class. Um, homework policy, so everyone should write their own homework, I guess. If you're taking an 8,000 level class, you probably have done a lot of homeworks already, so you kind of know what the policy should be. Uh, prerequisite, so the prerequisite is grad standing in engineering, uh, math, math, math or physical sciences, but the fact of the matter is you do need a prior background in optimization and some background in random processes. So whether you have taken a class in statistics, math, EC or some other department, which involves uh, topics such as convergence of random variables, weak and strong law of large numbers, central limit theorem, Markov chains. If you are familiar with these topics, if you understand the results, uh, such as convergence in probability implies convergence in uh, distribution and so on, then you are prepared for this class, okay? On the optimization front, you need to have some background in dynamic programming, maximum principle, gradient descent, uh, algorithms, and linear programming, all of which are covered as part of EC5759. So I kind of recognize most of the faces here, uh, which means that most of you have taken EC5759 already, so it shouldn't be a big problem to follow the optimization part of the class. But I haven't taught EC6001, so I don't know who all have taken 6001. If you have not, or if you have not taken a course that in introduces all these concepts about uh, random variables, then uh, I would highly recommend you drop this class. Um, I, I'm not going to review any of the material from the prerequisites listed above. Okay, anyone who has not taken any course in random processes or probability or things like that? Okay, so everyone is prepared for this class then. Project report is due on April 14th, um, and the format is given there so you can take a look at it. Uh, course description, so we'll start with uh, Markov decision problems. We'll talk about uh, algorithms for solving MDPs in the next week, and after that we'll jump directly into the reinforcement learning theory. So we'll talk about various classes of RL algorithms, uh, stochastic approximation theory, um, multi-arm bandits, uh, universal function approximators, as well as uh, uh, solving rein so reinforcement learning algorithms for continuous state, continuous action problems. If you need any accommodation due to disability, let me know. Um, if you engage in any misconduct, uh, you will be, disciplinary actions will be taken against you, and you are expected to abide by the student code of conduct. So that's all uh, for the introduction. Anyone has any questions about the course? Okay. I've already given assignment, I've already posted assignment one, so before I posted assignment one, there were 65 people registered for this class. After I posted assignment one, it dropped to 50, so that's a good sign. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, 
let's talk a little bit about probability and conditional probability first and then we'll talk about Markov decision problems. Oh, uh, another thing, since the, the enrollment has dropped below 50, or rather it's at 50 at this point of time, uh, I'm going to change the classroom to Baker Systems uh, 188, so that way everything will be connected to Dries Lab. So next class, or perhaps next to next class onwards, I'll send out an announcement on Carmen, so the, there'll be an official change of classroom because we don't need such a large classroom anymore. Okay. So let's start with uh, some notions of probability that we will use throughout the course. So omega is the set of all uncertainty F is set of all events which are also, which should also be measurable subsets of omega. And I'm going to define what measurable means in a few minutes. And then P is the probability distribution over omega. Okay? In this description, those of you who have taken real analysis would know what measurable means, but I don't expect any of you have to have taken real analysis. So. Let me try and understand or explain what measurable would mean. So, so this is of course a mathematical concept, measurable, but in real life, in our day-to-day -day activities, what does it mean for something to be measurable? What is measurable? Yeah. Well, in this context, I'd say that the probability of something occurring is non-zero. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, so let's let's look at this. Uh, the length of this chalk, is it measurable quantity? We can use a scale and we can measure it. What about the volume of this chalk? Is that a measurable quantity? Right? We can measure the volume of this chalk as well. What about happiness? How happy we are? Is that a measurable quantity? Okay. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully this class will make you happy, uh, or happier uh, than what it is today, or what you are today. But anyways, so what does it mean for a set to be measurable? Okay, so let's consider a set, 0, 1. Can we measure the length of the set? Okay, so the length is 1 minus 0, so that's equal to 1. So the length is, so length is a measurable quantity for this set and that's equal to one minus zero equals to one. Similarly, length of A comma B is B minus A, uh, assuming that B is greater than A, greater than or equal to A. Okay, so length appears to be a measurable quantity for a subset of real line. Let's look at area of 0, 1 cross 0, 5. Is this a measurable quantity? So what is 0, 1 cross 0, 5? So this is my R2. This is 1, this is 5, this is 0. So 0, 1 cross 0, 5 is this region. What's the area of this region? 5. So it looks like area in R2, area is something that we can measure, right? At least for sets of this type.
So there is a notion of measure, uh, and we can apply that notion onto sets, and that implies that this set, 0, 1, appears to be, a, so let's say omega is r. So 0, 1 appears to be a measurable subset of omega because I can measure the length of that set. Okay. In this case, omega is r2, and area appears to be a quantity we can measure. And for sets like these, I can actually measure what the area looks like. So how do we know which set subsets of omega are measurable? So here is a simple construction that allows us to construct measurable subsets of real line or R2. And I'm not going to be mathematically completely correct, but very close to what is actually true, so that you understand this concept of measurability. So let's say omega is equal to r. I let f0 be set of all closed and open intervals. As we saw, that we can always measure the length of a closed or an open interval. So length of 0, 1 is equal to 1, and length of 0, 1 also is equal to 1. So for open intervals as well as for closed intervals, I can compute the length exactly. Let f1 be finite and countable unions and intersections of sets in F0. OK? So I pick all the sets, all the open and closed intervals. I take their finite unions finite intersections, countable unions, countable intersections. And I put all those sets as part of F1. Okay. I do the same thing, F2, finite and countable unions and intersections of sets in F1. And I continue this process until I hit F infinity. OK? So I can measure the length of these sets. Then I can measure the lengths and lengths of these sets, sets in F1. Then I can measure the length of sets in F2, and so on. So what I get at, at, at F infinity is the set of all sets whose length can be measured if omega was equal to r. And this is the set of all. measurable subsets of R. OK? And these are known as Borel measurable subsets of R. OK? So that's what I mean by measurable subsets of omega. And it is also the same as set of all events. So events is used in probability books, measurable subsets is used in real analysis books, but they mean the same thing. Okay? Now how do we measure measurable subsets in the case of probability? So in this case, we were measuring the subset using uh, something called as length. So length appears to be a yardstick, that is a scale with which we measure a subset. In the case of probability, this p, the probability distribution, is the scale. And we measure subsets 
using this scale. The scale is the probability measure P, or probability distribution P. So P is a function from F to 0, 1, and it satisfies several uh, properties, OK? So P takes as input an event or a measurable subset of omega, and it outputs a number between 0 and 1. And it tells us what's the probability of that event happening, what's the probability of what's the length of that particular subset, OK? If you're using P as the scale for that particular subset. OK, so right now it's a bit abstract, but over the course of this class, uh, some of these things will become clearer and clearer because we'll use it more often in our uh, proofs. Any questions so far? OK. So what is it that the probability satisfies? What is it that this function should satisfy? So P of phi, the empty set, must be equal to 0. P of omega must be equal to 1. And if A1 to A infinity, R, or if A1 I equals 1 to infinity is a sequence of this joint subsets of omega, then P of union AI, I equals to 1 to infinity is summation P of AI, I equals 1 to infinity. These are the two essential properties that P must satisfy. Why is this important? So let's look at it from a different perspective. So I have length of 0, 1 union 2, 5. So these two subsets are disjoint subsets. They don't have any elements in common. So how do I measure the length of this union? So what does this union look like? So it looks like 0, 1, and then 2, and 5. OK, so what's the length of this union of two line segments? 4. So it's length of 0, 1 plus length of 2, 5, so equal to 4. So probability also must satisfy the same condition as this one, but not just for finite. So this is a finite union. It should satisfy for countable unions as well. OK. Any questions so far? OK, great. Next, we move on to random variables. So what is a random variable?
So random variable is x that maps omega to r or it could be n or it could be rn, okay? You pick a point in omega, map it under the influence of function x, gives you a point in r or n or rn and this is known as a random variable. Okay, sometimes some books will, if x maps omega to rn, they will call it a random vector. But in this, in this class, everything is a random variable. Whether it takes values in rn or n or r or n in r infinity or n infinity, it doesn't matter. All of it is random variable. Okay. So, Sometimes we are interested in knowing what's the probability that x is in set A. It's the same as probability of omega in x inverse A. Okay, and this should be a measurable subset so that we can measure the probability of that particular event. Okay? Now two random variables, so let's say I have two random variables, x1 and x2, both mapping from omega to r, then they are independent. for every a1, a2 as a subset of R, we have probability of x1 in a1, x2 in a2 Okay, so the joint probability is the same as product of the two individual distributions. That implies that the random variables x1 and x2 are independent of each other. The last thing that I want to talk about is conditional distribution. So probability of x1 in A given x2 in B is the same as probability x1 is in A, x2 is in B over probability x2 is in B. Okay, this is known as conditional probability. Of course, you can only define conditional probability in this way if this is a, a positive number. If it is a zero number, then you have to be a bit more careful about defining the conditional probability. But nonetheless, it can be defined. Okay. So if omega was discrete, oh, sorry, any questions so far? on the conditional probability, okay? So I'm guessing all of you have seen this in your 6001 class or an equivalent class, uh, but I still want to formalize everything in this class so that, because we are going to refer to it again and again throughout the class. Okay. For the first half of the class, which is until spring break, we are going to concentrate mostly on finite MDPs and after spring break, we'll talk about continuous state MDPs. 
So in finite MDPs, omega is usually a finite or a countable set. So let's assume that it's a finite set, 1 to n. And the probability of i given j is usually given by the joint probability i j over probability of j. Okay, so this is something that all of you are perhaps familiar with because this is heavily used both in undergraduate probability class as well as in 6001 type classes. Okay, so this is perhaps the most familiar, um, most familiar um, formula that you would remember from there. This is known as Bayes' rule. Okay. Questions. Okay, let's start talking about um, dynamic decision problem. So I have a problem. Let's, uh, let's think about a data center problem. And the problem is as follows. So if you have taken 5759, you would know this problem. But the problem is as follows. I have a large data center. Uh, the jobs keeps coming in. So I need to send someone a video or, um, you know, so people go to their houses, like you will go to your house in the evening today and you will open your Netflix or Amazon Prime or um, some other service, YouTube, and you want to, you request a video. So that request goes to a data center and the data center has to start sending you, divide the video into small packets and start sending you packets so that you can watch the video at your end, on your TV or on your laptop or on your phone. Okay. So, So what happens is every time you request such a service or if you're running a code online, what happens is these big computers start processing the information that is received or execute the code that you are running or it will start processing the chunk of video and start sending it to you via internet. And in this process, the computers generate heat or the processors generate heat and that heat needs to be expelled to the environment. And the way you do it is through an air conditioning system, right, or a chiller system. So the goal is, the goal for the data center is to maintain the temperature within a specified range. So the range of temperature within this data center should be between 10 degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius. So it shouldn't go above 15 degrees Celsius. It shouldn't go below 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's the goal that the data center wants to maintain within that data center. So this is a so now what should be a decision problem? What should be an optimization problem in this case? What is it that you would like to optimize? Sorry? No, but the data is the data. So a video is a video. It could be 800 MB video. And so you have to send the entire thing. So you cannot really use that as a metric. We want to minimize the uh, energy cost of keeping the data center in that temperature range given right. the demand. Right. So given the demand, which is external demand, which is coming from the environment, you don't control it. So given the demand, you want to minimize the energy cost in order to keep the temperature within that range. Any other objective that you may want to minimize? Okay, so you want to minimize the energy. But energy itself could be very cheap or could be costly. So typically energy is measured in terms of dollar value. So how much you are paying for the electricity, how much you are paying for the gas, which is 
making sure that the data center is uh, kept at that specified range. So typically, you want to minimize the dollar cost of running the data center or minimizing the energy cost of running the data center within that specified temperature range. So now this becomes a dynamic decision problem because the jobs keeps arriving throughout the day, throughout the night, throughout the morning. And, and depending upon the size of the job and depending upon what the current state of the data center is, you need to decide when and how much cold air should be injected into the data center. OK? All right. So how do we model this problem? OK? How do we model this problem? That's question number one. And what are the essential ingredients of this problem? So let's think of it from an engineer's perspective. So in this particular data center, what I do is I observe Then I act. So I observe the current temperature, and I inject cold air into the system. And then I get a, a cost. And this is the cost of this is the cost of energy that you have paid. So one megawatt hour, two megawatt hour, and so on. So this cost comes almost instantaneously as you act. Then you again make an observation. Then you again act. And then you again accrue some cost, and so on. OK, so this cycle keeps going. It's not a cycle, but this sequence keeps going on and on. So you observe, you act, you accrue some cost, then you observe some more, you act, and then you ob observe some other cost, and then so on and so forth. OK? So let me write this observation. So what would you observe? So what would, what would be the thing that you would observe in this data center example? So how you act is sort of pretty clear. How much, uh, what should the temperature be, or what, how much heat you should repel from that particular data center? So that part, act, action part, is pretty clear in this particular example. But what all things can you observe? in this data center example. So you can certainly observe the temperature, the current temperature of this data center. What else can you observe? Sorry? The? Right, so demand. So you can observe the temperature. You can observe the demand. What else can you observe? You can observe the outside temperature, so weather, let's say. On a cold day, like today, it's perhaps easier or cheaper to repel heat from the data center to the environment. But on a hot summer day, it perhaps is more difficult. So you do have to keep weather into account. What else can you observe? Perhaps you, yeah. Uh, depending on the time of day, we could have an expectation about what we expect the demand to be later on. Right. what we know about the process. OK, so future demand, estimation of future demand, or let's say I just write it as future demand. So this is a forecast. OK, you could have renewable energy. A lot of data centers are now moving to renewable energy in order to keep their energy cost down, because renewable energy doesn't cost any money to generate. OK? So renewable energy production, that's something you can observe. Uh, let me add some observations that, observations from my side. So I can observe the temperature of moon, OK? I've sent a probe, and I can get the minute-to-minute -minute information about what the temperature on the surface of moon is. 
I can also observe that. And I can use this information to decide on my action. Okay? So there are some observations that are obvious, some non-obvious observations that I'm going to use and use it for my action. Okay, and I'm going to accrue some cost and so on and so forth. So this is your, let me denote it by I0. So that's my state, I0, not state. Uh, it's just an observation at this moment. My action will be denoted by U0. The cost that I would accrue would be a function of I0 and U0 and so on. Okay. So I'm observing this I0, U0, I1, so U1, so I'm ignoring cost for the time being, and so on. And the question is, this is a never-ending increase in the amount of data I'm collecting. So I know the temperature last hour, or yesterday, I know the temperature today. Um, no. So let's say I0 was, the first day data center was opened, what was the temperature at that time, then what happened, what actions I picked, then what was the temperature on the next day, what actions I took, and so on and so forth. So there is a blow up in the amount of data that you are generating and storing. And it's not very useful to store so much data in order to make a decision, okay? So this was the problem that was faced around 1900s, early 1900s or mid 1900s where you have these decision problems, you have a large number of data that is getting collected very quickly, and then the question is we need to somehow represent this data in a more compact form, okay? And that leads to the notion of state. So state summarizes the memory. OK, so in your memory, you have a lot of data and you want to compactify that data, and you use state to compactify it. So what is the definition of a state? Well, the state must satisfy. So let's say I define S0, S1, S2, and so on as the state. So this must satisfy the probability of st given s1 to st minus 1 or s0 to st minus 1, i0 to it, should I have it minus 1 or it? Let me put it as it minus 1 and u0 to ut minus 1. So I come up with some variables that I think summarizes the entire memory. And I'm going to check if the probability that my current state, given all this entire history that I've seen so far, is equal to Just two variables, st minus 1 and ut minus 1.
So the current state is a function of previous state and the previous action. I don't have to worry about what happened in the past, except for what happened just immediately one step before the current time step. It doesn't depend on that. So ST minus 1 would encode all the information that this has, all the information that is relevant within IT minus 1. OK? So now let's look at each of these variables and see whether which of them would correspond to the state of the system. So would temperature be the state of a system? So let's think about it. The temperature now in this room is a function of what the temperature was an hour ago. It doesn't really depend on what the temperature was one million years ago at this particular point, right? So temperature appears to be the state which depends on the temperature in the previous state uh, at the previous time step and the amount of heat injected or rejected from the system in the previous time step. Let's look at the demand. Demand appears to be an exogenous variable, so it's something that you do not control. And that also, I mean, you could have a situation where the demand depends on what happened previously. So to give you an example, at 5 p.m. or at 6 p.m., there will be a spike in the number of Netflix data that is requested. That's because a lot of people go back home and they start their Netflix and they start watching some shows. Okay, so the demand appears to have uh, some time dependence and it also follows either it will be IID, the demand would be IID or the demand would have some dependence with respect to the past. Whether the weather today is dependent on what the weather was an hour ago or five hours ago or ten hours ago, doesn't matter what happened here one million years ago. Uh, future demand. That's also a forecast. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little later, OK? So this, I wouldn't consider it as a state at this point of time, but it could be a state in some situation. Renewable energy generation is also a state. What about temperature on, of moon? Temperature on the surface of moon. Does it satisfy this condition? So it doesn't depend on UT minus 1, which is fine, but the temperature of the moon now is a function of what the temperature was earlier plus some randomness um, associated with the va variation in temperature on the planet or, or on the moon. OK. So what's the crux here? I have a bunch of observables. I want to somehow encode the information that is necessary for me to take an action and not have this whole memory to decide on what the action should be. So I, that introduces a notion of state. The state summarizes the entire memory to what is actually needed for making the decision. So how do you mathematically define a state? Well, the state is a collection of variables so that the probability that ST probability of ST given all the past states, past observations, past actions is purely dependent on the past state, the immediately past state and the immediately past action, nothing else. Now you could have states that are payoff relevant. Payoff relevant. Or you could have states that are payoff irrelevant. So this is where the notion of cost comes in. Okay? So if I look at these states, is there a variable that doesn't really affect the cost of energy in this observables? Yeah. Temperature on the moon. Temperature on the moon. Okay, so that doesn't depend, that doesn't affect the cost that we pay for our electricity. So that's an irrelevant state. Okay. 
So temperature of moon, it's an irrelevant state, and we can remove it from our description of the state space. And of course, there are these other uh, states that are payoff relevant because it really affects the cost that we are going to pay for our electricity. Okay, so all others. Okay. So is the concept of state clear? Yes. So if we're defining the state yes. such that uh, it follows that process, uh, isn't that going to be sort of cyclical because we could redefine the state uh, to augment it depend on the uh, past two states? So that isn't really a, a, a implementable argument without saying it needs to be first order or anything like that, is it? Right. So uh, what you are talking about is definitely you can augment the state with many other variables. Um, what is important to remember is that given a dynamic decision problem, it's your job to define what the state is, and, it's, and the cost function will be given, and you want to have the minimal description of the state, which encodes all the information regarding the cost. As you can see, temperature of the moon is a description, is part of the state space because, I mean, it's not part of the state space. You can augment the necessary states with the temperature of the moon, so this is an augmented state, but it doesn't really affect your cost, and therefore you can remove it from your description. I, I more meant you could augment it with values like the weather now and the weather a step ago, and you can just encode that in right. the same state, but right. that's not extraneous then. Uh, you, you could have a model that did depend on that, and it would still satisfy the definition, would it? Yes, it is, uh, it is commonly done in research, but uh, we can perhaps talk about it offline. So yes, when there is a long-range dependence on the history, you tend to augment the state with the history in order to, in order to uh, expand your state space so that it becomes, it follows this process. Exactly, okay? I'm trying to think where you do that. Uh, forget it. At this point, I'm not able to come up with a simple example where you augment the state. So Sorry? For example, if you want to predict an action of uh, like an athlete, uh -huh. maybe it's not good to just observe the, you know, the, the state of his current action. Uh, right. Current, act, uh, current right. posture. You want a little bit of history about yes. where he was, what where she was. Great, okay, so, so his example is that if you want to understand what the athlete is going to do next, you just don't look at the, what he's, he or she is doing now, but you look at the history of what he or she has done in the immediate past. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point, yeah. So in that case, you do need to augment the state with not only what he or she has been doing now, but what he and she has been doing in the past in order to make sure that you encode all the information that is relevant for predicting what the cost would be if he or she takes an action. That's a good point. So in your assignment, if you look at it, your assignment, I have given a question. Uh, problem number three, when to sell a house, okay? And in that problem, the question is to identify the state, so it's a business problem, and every time you get an observation and you need to decide on something, which is whether to sell the house now or not, so every time you observe an offer, you need to decide on whether to sell the house now or wait for a new offer to come in the future, and I've asked you to determine <coughs> what the state space is going to be, what the state is going to be in that problem, and what's the total, what's the overall objective function for the seller. Okay, so you will get a chance to use your imagination to come up with an appropriate state for that decision problem. Okay.
Okay, so we have done enough of abstract mumbo jumbo. So now let's talk about Markov decision problems. The basic model of Markov decision problem. So I have no, I am going to use the following notation. So I T plus one is distributed according to So I'm going to use the notation from uh, Bertzikas and Sitsikilis book on neurodynamic programming. Uh, but different books have different notations, so it's very hard to be consistent throughout the class. But hopefully, I'll try to be as consistent as possible. OK, so here I was using i0 to denote the observation. So in a most widely used Markov decision problem, the observation is usually the same as the state, because you can observe the state exactly. So I'm just going to use IT as the state of the system. So this is state. This is action. At time t, the next state is generated according to a transition probability. So this transition probability will be denoted by PIJU. This is the probability that you will see j as the next state given i is the current state and u is the current action. Okay, So this p has double vertical lines and this p has a single line. So I guess you would be able to differentiate between the two p's. This is known as the state transition or probability transition matrix. No, transition probability matrix. This is the transition state transition probability matrix, uh, PIJU. I'm going to assume that S is the set of all states. So this is finite until spring break. U is the set of all actions which is also assumed to be finite Okay. C I U J is the cost incurred uh, when current state is I, action is U. And the next state is J. Okay. 
okay now one thing that i am going to note here is i am not letting p be dependent on time so p is time homogeneous the cost is also not dependent on time so the cost is also time homogeneous so this is a time homogeneous uh, mdp because p and c does not depend on time so they are independent of time t so this is known as time homogeneous or stationary both of which are used interchangeably okay how many of you are familiar with dynamic programming how many of you are not familiar with dynamic programming okay a few of you okay all right so let's do a finite horizon mdp first so in finite horizon mdp i o oh, i have a cost function or let me write it as objective to minimize summation t equals to 0 to capital t c of it ut and jt jt plus 1 or it plus 1 okay so i want to take the expectation of the total cost i have accrued over the last t plus 1 time steps should i put a terminal cost as well let me put a terminal cost ct plus 1 i T plus one. Okay, so this is the total cost of energy that I am going to consume in the data center, plus some reward or some cost for a certain temperature at the end of the day. Let's say at twelve midnight. usually this terminal cost would be zero in some problems but in some problem there is a terminal cost associated with it okay but how do we minimize this what exactly are we minimizing over okay so let's talk about that so we want to minimize this objective function but how do we minimize it what is it that we are minimizing over so let's talk about policies so so policy decision rule strategy uh law not law uh has some other name okay so all of these words all of these terminologies are used interchangeably so let's try and define that yes so for the objective function that we're minimizing over there are we considering that there's constraints like what you said for the range of temperatures or we're we relaxing that and just putting it all of that will be uh encoded in the state of the in the set of all states okay so we're considering these other constraints yes everything is finite everything is discretized 
Okay, so what is a policy in a dynamic decision problem? So remember, we were talking about, I'm going to observe something, and based on my observations, I'm going to act, right? So policy, or strategy, or decision rule is a map that maps the information to action, okay? So I'm going to use mu to denote a generic policy that maps information to action. So in this particular problem, this is a Markov decision problem, you are generating a sequence of data points, so I0, U0, I1, U1, I2, U2, and so on. So what would your information be at time t? So let's think about it. Okay, so I'm generating a lot of data over a period of time. So I have different notions, different types of information. So one is history, uh, which is denoted by HT, and that's given by I0, U0, I1, U1, and IT. Or you could have memory less. Markov, also known as memory less, where my information is just IT. I just use my current state to make a decision. I don't look at what happened in the past. Okay. So mu mapping from H T uh, let let's use H T to denote the set of all such histories set of histories then mu is a function of H T to U T this is known as history dependent policy. So history dependent deterministic policy because it's mapping the history to action set. So this is, let me write it in full form, history dependent deterministic policy. I could have mu that maps S to U. Oh, I'm, I shouldn't use T because uh, it doesn't depend on time. The state space and the action space remains the same across time. So this is known as Markov deterministic policy. Okay, so we have talked about two types of policies at this point of time. One that takes a policy that takes into account the entire history that I've seen so far. That's known as history dependent deterministic policy. Another policy which just takes the current state into account, makes a decision, that's known as Markov deterministic policy. Um, there is another class of policies that you can define. So mu 
that maps ht to a probability distribution over u. So let me denote it by delta u. So this is the probability distribution over u. And this is known as history dependent randomized policy. Okay, so randomized because now you are tossing a coin and then taking an action. Okay, so I look at the history of what I have eaten in the past 10 meals and then I toss a coin and decide whether I should eat apples or sandwiches next. Okay, so that's a randomized policy. And then I have mu from S to delta over U, and this is Markov randomized. Okay. So let's think about it. I have a dynamic process. I need to take actions in that dynamic process. I've spent some time identifying the state of the system and the actions of the, uh, on that system. I have an objective function that's given to me. I need to determine how am I going to behave in that particular decision problem. And it turns out there are four possible ways of behaving. So one way of behaving is to look at the entire history of data that I've collected, look at the entire history, toss a coin, and then take an action based on the outcome of the toss. The another policy is I look at the current state, toss a coin, and then take an action. The third policy is I look at the entire history and take an action based on that history. The fourth class of policies is I look at the current state and then take an action uh, based on the decision rule mu. Okay. This one is the most general policy because it takes into account the entire history, generates a toss of a coin and then makes use of that toss, the outcome, to decide the control action. And this is the smallest set of policies because it just looks at the current state and takes an action. So with the history, sorry, with the randomized uh, policies, what class of problem would it be beneficial for us to be randomizing our control decision based on? Ah, okay, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. So his question is, uh, when would you like to use this policy. Any suggestions? Yeah. What if like you were playing like Go? Uh huh. And, um, you didn't want your two AIs to play the exact same game right. over and over. Yeah. And you can introduce them randomly. Right? Wow, you, you, you got the answer correct. So whenever you are in a game situation, whenever two people are competing with each other, okay, I, I know some of you have taken the game theory class, but many of you have not. So whenever two people are competing with each other, you almost always randomize, okay? Uh, so whether you are playing chess, whether you are playing, playing Go, or whether you are, uh, I don't know, playing football or soccer or cricket or whatever other favorite game you have, or table tennis, you almost always randomize, okay? And of course, you, in some cases, you may keep track of the history. In some cases, you may not keep track of the history. Just look at the current state. But typically, you randomize only in game settings. Um, but of course, we won't talk about it until perhaps the final class or final week. So in the last week, we'll talk about, uh, what was that topic? Multi-agent RL, multi-agent reinforcement learning. 
will perhaps revisit this particular point at that particular, uh, in, in the last week, if we <coughs> reach that time, if we reach to that particular topic by the end of the semester. But anyway, so you have these four set of uh, policies, so let me give it a name. So I'm going to use Should I use M? What should I use as the space of policies? Let's use M for now. Uh, but I'll have to release this notation sometime in the future. But let's, for the time being, let's let use M, HR, to denote the set of all such policies. M, MR to denote the set of all such policies, all the Markov randomized policies, and then M H D and then M M D. Okay. And we have the following uh, obvious inclusion, M, M, D is a subset of M, M, R, which is a subset of M, H, R. And M, M, D is a subset of M, HD, which is a subset of M H R. Okay, so we have these obvious two inclusions. So all deterministic, all Markov deterministic policies are part of history dependent policies, history dependent de deterministic policies. And all history dependent deterministic policies are part of history dependent randomized policies. And the same thing can be said for this particular inclusion as well. Okay. Okay, so now I have this objective function. I want to minimize over an appropriate set of policies. And the question is, over what policies should we minimize this objective function? What do you think should we be minimizing over in this particular problem? What I mean is, you want to eat a sandwich. OK, so that's the set of actions. You have some objective function. Let's say you want to make sure that all the vitamins and minerals are there in your diet in appropriate quantities and proportion. So that would be your objective function. What should you minimize over? Well, you know, due to the example about the randomized policies, since this isn't a game, we're not going to be using those. And then and the Markov deterministic policy would be the best. Well, if we can get away with it as optimal, it's going to be right. the easiest to analyze. Right. And so the Markov deterministic policy, unless we have such a reason that we need to go to the history dependent. Right. OK. Uh, so his point is, let's not go to randomized strategy. So I think you have, uh, you know, I've, I've given you the answer that you use it in game situations. So you perhaps. Uh, Where is the you have biased, yes. Okay, so any other thoughts? Any other? Yeah. I'll use history dependent. History dependent deterministic? Yeah, so HD or HR? <laughs> no, I don't want to randomize. You don't want randomized, okay. So I don't want to eat sandwich on a daily basis. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, so let's, uh, 
So it looks like everybody wants to minimize over MHD, but let me be a bit more bold and I want to minimize over MHR. Okay? So I want to minimize over all mu, which is uh, over history dependent and randomized policies. Now, of course, this mu would comprise of mu 0, mu 1, mu 2 all the way up to mu capital T, because we have T time steps to decide. One of the results that we are going to prove in the next class, well, maybe we'll not prove, but let me just tell you what that result is. If you're minimizing over a history dependent randomized policies, you can always pick a Markov deterministic policy that will give you the same expected cost. Okay, which means that you don't necessarily have to look at the entire history and you don't necessarily have to randomize. You can actually just look for an optimal policy within the class of Markov deterministic policy. So what I'm going to do in the next class, I'm going to introduce dynamic programming to solve this problem, introduce discounted cost, average cost, and stochastic shortest path problems. And I also want to prove this result that you don't have to go to history dependent randomized policy. You can just restrict yourself to Markov deterministic policy. But in order to prove that, I don't know how much time it's going to take. So let me do an assessment um, over the next two days. And then I will either write down what the precise result is. And if we can go ahead and prove it, I'll go ahead and prove it. If we cannot prove it due to lack of time, I'll just state the result and move on to uh, ex move on to introducing dynamic programming as well as uh, other notions of cost. So thank you, and I'll see you on Thursday.